Welcome everybody. Welcome to our December Government Affairs Committee meeting for the Vista Chamber of Commerce. We are so excited to have Eric Ruvold with us today from San Diego North EDC. Um, he, uh, his organization has put together some really great data and information about the economic impact of COVID-19 along the 78 corridor. So we're really excited to have him with us today and uh, look forward to hearing from him. So uh, as we were just discussing uh, before we kicked off the meeting, there's some important announcements coming from the governor's office today. So we're gonna jump right into our meeting so that we can um, hear this awesome information and then find out what's happening um, from the governor. So with that, Eric, uh, feel free to introduce yourself and then um, take it away. Great, hi, well, I'm Eric Ruvald. I'm the CEO of the San Diego North Economic Development Council. Uh, I've had that role now for uh, coming up on just almost three years, uh, three year anniversary in January of uh, January of next year. Um, and um, uh, we put together uh, a uh, report, as Rachel said, we're the only economic development entity that works uh, kind of region wide or across different cities up here in North County. So we were excited to do a, a research report uh, that looked at sort of the, the impacts of COVID-19 by city and by industry um, uh, for the first six months of the shutdown order. So, uh, Rachel, can people see my screen at this point? I uh, believe so. Perfect. All right. So I'll just go through. I've just got a few little slides and then I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Um, find the full report and I'll make sure Rachel gets the URL, but you can find the full report that we did uh, on our website under our research section. Um, so uh, this gives you the URL uh, if you're interested. Uh, I'm going to hit the main highlights, uh, but there are some additional act, uh, things that are in there. And I think, you know, really to set the stage, and I think that that's an important place to begin, um, is that if you look at the five years up until uh, when we had the March shutdown order, um, the corridor had enjoyed, uh, you know, robust growth. And, uh, you know, we've talked about that in a variety of ways. That's put additional uh, demands on our transportation system, our housing stock, uh, and, and, and what have you. But there's been a good story to be told about job growth uh, since uh, 2000, uh, really to, since 2010. But I took this data and looked at the last five years uh, up and before the shutdown uh, order. And so you see in the first uh, table, uh, what we looked like uh, you know, along the corridor. So, you know, over 35,000 jobs added uh, to the five cities uh, that make up the 78 corridor. And in Vista, uh, you know, a, a almost, uh, or, you know, a little bit uh, 5,000 job growth uh, in the city of Vista uh, alone. That is payroll jobs. So what that doesn't include, um, uh, and though we have that data available, it doesn't include uh, W-9 employees, people that are independent contractors, folks that are sole proprietors, which also have seen uh, good job growth. So if we lump those in, uh, we'd get you know, about another 30,000 throughout the, the period of time. Uh, but again, I think the bottom line is, is that we saw job, good job growth up till uh, the shutdown order uh, in March of this year. Um, this shows you uh, how that played itself out in terms of unemployment rate uh, along the corridors. This just took the five cities and averaged them. They've all done about the same. And you can see just, you know, the dramatic spike. This isn't, you know, rocket science and not necessarily anything that people didn't know, but uh, just how much we spiked uh, when we saw the numbers in April and then how that has slowly come down as businesses have reopened and adapted. As well, we've seen people leave the labor market. So unemployment rate is going to reflect both those things. Jobs added back as people have been called back and adapted and re-engineered their business processes, as well as people leaving the labor market and either not looking for jobs or giving up you know, hope uh, for them. Clearly, some of the data indicates um, that the additional unemployment benefit um, did uh, encourage some folks to continue to sit on the sidelines. And people can debate right or wrongly uh, whether that served uh, a good or bad or what kind of purpose that that served. But the data is pretty clear 
that there was a proportion uh, of that unemployment number that was impacted. It is not the full number. So the additional unemployment benefits would not be, uh, you know, back to, we, our unemployment rate wouldn't be back down to 4.1% uh, absent that. Uh, but there is some number uh, where we know that people are not looking for jobs because of the, the extended benefit. Um, and, and there's good data to show that. Um, this shows you though, and, I, and I'll just go through this, this is really busy, um, but it shows you just how much that there were um, really six segments um, and they're bolded, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but um, bolded in terms of where those major impacts were um, in uh, along the corridor. And so if we look at it about 75% uh, of the job losses uh, if we look at August 2019 versus August 2020, uh, we're located uh, in the following uh, job categories. Retail trade, uh, not surprising. Uh, we've seen significant declines in that. Um, and, and that number is actually probably even a little bit more uh, dramatic because um, the, the, the 5,000, negative 5,000 is a net number. We've seen in, increased employment at um, grocers and uh, grocery stores and full service big box stores, um, and then significant declines in other sorts of retail areas. Uh, accommodation and food services, and I'll come back to that, that's a lumped in category, uh, but that saw 11,000 uh, job losses and by far the biggest impact that we've seen along the corridor has been in that segment. Um, and something, you know, when we get to the policy recommendations that our organization tried to highlight, um, it really focuses in on, on that uh, segment and thinking it through. Um, 3,800 or 3,900 jobs uh, were lost uh, in arts and entertainment and recreation and, and fully almost you know, on percentage terms, half of the employment that we had uh, in that uh, sector as of August uh, 2019 has been lost. And, you know, I'm sure this committee has talked about or the board has talked about uh, Moonlight Amphitheater losing its season uh, and having to shut down. This also would include uh, things like Legoland uh, or and parts of the Del Mar Fairgrounds uh, and the employment that's been lost there. And this is probably even more um, kind of understates the number. It's been even more dramatic in that sector because a number of the, the workers in that sector work as W-9s and as independent contractors. So uh, they're not all, this is all um, uh, payroll data. So if we added those numbers in, uh, the decline would be uh, even greater. Something that people might not be aware of is the losses in the K-16 uh, public education space. So while teachers and administrators and faculty uh, have been largely uh, insulated from the decline, um, folks that work as paraprofessionals or as adjuncts or kind of less uh, uh, connected uh, to those educational institutions, they have suffered significant layoffs and we've seen a 15.7% uh, decline uh, in those numbers, both in the K, you know, that are, are broken out in these two things, okay? basically public education and then uh, the private education aspects of it. And so, you know, overall, the, the, the corridor has lost uh, 36,000 uh, jobs um, from uh, where we were in August, if we look at year over year um, effort. And again, very, you know, fairly focused and concentrated in a relatively narrow uh, segment. Manufacturing is interesting. And again, um, you know, what we've understood from manufacturing, um, it is, uh, it's been exceedingly um, uh, sort of disparate in terms of the impact. So, Companies um, that have been focused in on um, folks that are doing home improvement or recreational goods or things that people are doing uh, kind of to survive there, you know, through um, uh, COVID uh, have actually done well. So uh, not a Vista company, but we can tell you, you know, I, I have heard the Hunter Industries here in San Marcos. This is going to be one of the best years they've ever had because people are spending money on their uh, 
on, on their landscaping and uh, and putting improvements in their in backyards. We hear that uh, you know uh, solar tubes in uh, Vista has also seen a demand for its products on the residential side, not necessarily on the commercial side, but on the residential side uh, as uh, people have looked to do a home improvement project. So the manufacturing number varies, but we have seen uh, declines in manufacturing employment uh, along the corridor from where we were in August of 2019. Um, this shows you taxable sales. And so I think one of the things that, um, you know, we need to understand uh, is uh, that um, the, uh, our, our municipalities, and some of that is going to be based upon reserves and other financial um, uh, safety nets that they had put in place. Uh, but uh, our municipalities are going to be facing, particularly in 2021, 2022, um, financial challenges as we continue to work through this. So what this shows you, and, and this is a little overstated, and I want to suggest because I think it gives us some really interesting things that are going to be coming down the pike at this. So what this looks at is quarter two taxable sales within the jurisdictions, so at physical locations within those jurisdictions, and looks at year over year changes. And so you see for Vista, that between quarter two uh, in 2019 and quarter two of uh, 2020, there was a 10% decline. Now that doesn't mean that, that Vista's revenues are off 10% and that's really important. What we've seen is that the county and, the, and it kind of comes into a county pool and then it's distributed, that online sales have made up a significant amount of that shortfall and that as that is distributed cities are going to be doing okay but what that does mean in the retail space is that we're seeing you know significant shifts in consumer patterns and probably speeding up people's transitions from uh brick and mortar to online sales and that has pretty profound implications for land use and economic development um, throughout the corridor so we wrote a report, it was interesting, it was lots of numbers, but econ geeks uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, appeals to us, but it's important to get some concrete steps out of it. So these were four things that we thought we could take away from. First, based upon really what we've seen in the hospitality sector and the declines in it, um, in terms of employment and challenges, we believe that it's important for the corridor really as a, as a corridor um, and not as individual cities, but to really think about whether we can make increased investment in hospitality and particularly in the leisure segment. One of the differences between North County's tourism market and downtown San Diego or, you know, south of us is that we just don't do as much convention and group meeting business as those hotels do. We do some, I mean, I don't want to discount that. They, you know, it, those are important aspects of it, but our bread and butter for our hospitality industry are dry market leisure travelers coming to our coast and staying in those properties. And it is important that as we come out of COVID and people begin to travel again, that those are investments that we continue to make to encourage folks to come and visit and spend money within North County in that particular segment. Something that the, you know, again, Vista Chamber may want to be thinking about is we believe as a council is that we're going to see continued uh, pressure, uh, even more so for adaptive reuse of retail centers. Um, it is, you know, consumer behavior is going to be changing. And to the extent, and we've already seen that, I think, what, up at the Vista Shopping Center that they have the or, you know, Toys R Us or Babies R Us used to be there, and I know now I think it's Burlington Coat Factory, but um, that there will be continued pressure to think about whether, as people's behavior has changed, whether some of that square footage and acreage should be reused for different purposes. And that is going to be a continuing dialogue and one that is important for cities and chambers to kind of have a, an honest heart to heart about whether those sales tax dollars are coming back in the form uh, in which they uh, did. I think one of the things that we've seen also, and, and that's something for the chamber and for cities to think about, is um, resiliency of small businesses. 
it, we as a council help the city of Escondido administer a small business grant program. We know that a number of other cities along the corridor have done similar programs. Uh, and I think that one of the things that we found out was is that um, there are a lot of small businesses, sadly, out there um, who um, don't have the most sophisticated bookkeeping systems or operation systems or business plans or marketing plans in place. And so COVID-19 was negatively impactful for them, but it hit into a small business which um, uh, maybe its foundation wasn't as strong as it could be. And so uh, hopefully we'll never go through another global pandemic, but there are crises and shocks that hit. And so thinking about how we can continue to build um, resiliency, I think, is important. And, and then this last one really gets to, I think, the unfortunate reality, and I think we're all starting to kind of wrap our heads around, um, that there are industries which face probably an additional six, nine, 12, 18 months of continued disruption. Uh, and how do we make sure that our workforce and career systems, you know, really do figure out a way uh, to, for lack of a better word, uh, and, and pardon me for being, you know, offensive to anybody, but a come to Jesus uh, conversation uh, with folks in industries um, who it is going to be a long haul before we get back to the kind of employment numbers uh, that they enjoyed. I, I, your guess is as good as mine, whether um, a vaccine will be readily available and distributed and where government will be. Uh, but I know that if I were betting my own money, I wouldn't be betting on a moonlight season in 2021. Uh, and that pains me to say, because I love the moonlight, but, um, but it's hard to have that, ha see where that has. And I would say the same thing for theme parks. I would say the same thing for really big group events. I know my council isn't, you know, we just kind of did another cut in our budget. I know I'm not planning on having big events until September at the, at the earliest. Um, and we're going to get from the governor, I think, the reason why in, in 30 minutes. So um, so that's, that's our report. You can download it. And uh, Rachel, I hope I didn't go over too much. And I hope I wasn't negative, um, too negative. So I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that people might have. Any questions for Eric? Feel free to use the chat feature or raise your hand if you have any questions. You know, Eric, I, I really appreciate you being here. And um, I see I see Gary, you have your hand up. Um, I really appreciate you being here and talking about the resiliency of small businesses. I know you and I've had a number of conversations about this and talking about, you know, there's so many key takeaways from the data that you found in the report that you put together. And, I, and I'm thankful uh, that we have the access to that full report. I see in the chat that Terry Woods uh, put that it's available on the North County Daily Star. And then again, it's also on your website, Eric, but, um, you know, talking about those industries with ongoing disruption, you know, the events industry comes to mind, talking about um, helping, how can, you know, the chamber be put in a position to help our uh, small businesses become more resilient. If you are a small business owner and you own a business, you do that business because you're passionate about that good or service or or thing or that widget. And so maybe you don't know how to do your accounting. And when you want to go for a PPP loan and you have to run a P&L and you don't know how to do that, that's a problem. And so there's definitely a role for the chamber to serve in that. And I'm really thankful for this report and for our ongoing conversations about this. So thank you. Sure. And I want to ask, uh, go over to Gary. Uh, it sounds like you had a question. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, yes, uh, actually two questions. One is how long do you think it will take to get back to normal? Obviously that's going to be politicians and medical experts and you know a whole array of other people, but you know, I'd be interested in your perspective. And two, it would seem to me that what the point that Rachel made about teaching or helping small businesses to change, to adapt, to, you know, create new ways to provide their, their, their service would be a major initiative of your organization. Yeah, no, I, I thank you for that, Gary. So, um, so I think what, I think what our report and what other economic data out of San Diego County, so I'm not going to talk nationwide, so I'm going to talk just specifically about San Diego County. Um, our ability to return to something that looks similar to our economy um, in uh, 2019, 
depends upon getting our hospitality industry back and running. I mean, I, I, I just, you know, in, in the end, it's just too big a segment for San Diego's economy. It's one of our three pillars. And until we, and, and really, it's getting leisure travel and occupancy rates back up to 90% and uh, average room rates up to, you know, where they were in 2019. Uh, until that gets, you know, close within 10%, let's say, of where we were in 2019, it is tough for us. It's tough for me to see how the economy kind of come, comes back. On, on the resiliency front, absolutely. And we've started to have conversations with chambers and economic developers uh, with that. And, and I think that there are two things. And so I'm kind of a big guy, you know, big person to believe, you know, walk before you run. Um, it, we absolutely need to work with businesses about re-engineering and rethinking um, and, and, and absolutely that. I think we were also were really shocked to see um, the, you know, there, there are some foundational pieces that people need. I mean, we worked with businesses in Escondido that didn't know what a balance sheet was. And so we had to sort of like start with, you know, start at that square one or folks that, you know, were overwhelmed and it was clear they were overwhelmed with even trying to keep their books in QuickBooks. And so um, what we do, what we think initially as sort of some efforts on this is to figure out how to build, um, you know, basically, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, business 101 stuff um, and to offer it through a variety of channels uh, for our small businesses that want to take advantage of that and try and build there. And then from there, really start to talk about re-engineering opportunities and rethinking. Because I think, you know, one of the things you, you hit on, you asked when we we're getting good at back to normal. I don't know if retail does get back to normal. Uh, I mean, I, I think there have been some pretty profound changes, and um, and, and so uh, that doesn't mean that we won't get some of it back. That doesn't. Uh, but you know, we've got some fundamental changes that have occurred. It would seem to me that w one feature that you could do as well as the chamber is start uh, highlighting those businesses that have made changes and that have re-engineered and and so forth, because as as companies see other companies being successful, that'll challenge them to, you know, sit back, put your feet on the desk and say, okay, how can we do business, you know, as good as we did before or better? I was in a, a small coffee shop and, and the owner of that shop used the term back to better. Yeah. And I think right. that attitude has to be prevalent throughout the business community. Yeah, and, and Gary, I, I think, you know, I, I guess, uh, and, and I agree with that. And, and then I guess, you know, I, I would, I'll challenge my board to do it. I'll challenge, you know, any, any audience uh, that we have. I think Rachel and I are really excited to do that. Finding those stories, I think, is, you know, the important place we can have, you know, help from volunteers to really, you know, be able to spotlight things that people think um, are doing it. I, it. One of the challenges that, you know, my organization, I'm sure Rachel, you know, feels it, it, it is, um, it's, it's challenging in our role to speak truth to, you know, kind of, kind of be the negative Nelly. Um, and because there, there's a lot of other people that just want to get back to normal and so forth. And it's going to be, it's going to sadly probably be another, you know, six to nine months long. Well, with that, on that cheery note, Sorry. we are going to move along to our next speaker. Thank you, Eric, for being here. Really appreciate you uh, for so many reasons. And um, um, next up, I want to um, introduce uh, Jennings Amal from the U.S. Chamber. He's here to give us an update. Thank you for being here, Jennings. Uh, Thanks, Rachel. Hope all is well with you. And um, so feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Oh, and I do want to mention just really quickly before I forget that if you would like to get future agendas or information uh, for this meeting, please put your either put your information in the chat or um, I am going to uh, right now put an email address that you can send an email to get um, get on the list to receive these agendas on a regular basis. So uh, thank you very much. And Jennings, uh, take it away. Cool. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Um, so happy to give kind of an update what's going on. Uh, you know, this week has been, uh, well, surprisingly busy. Uh, uh, next week also, I think is going to be pretty busy. Obviously, we have the, the government funding deadline that we're running up against uh, on Friday, December 11th. And then there's kind of been renewed talk about uh, another COVID relief package um, after, well, 
quite frankly, about what, a month and a half or so of silence uh, leading up to the election. Um, as all of you know, talks kind of ceased, um, but now there, things are kind of picking up a little bit. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that uh, and kind of what the strategy is moving forward to getting something done, prospects and what we all can do as a business community to, to help um, facilitate a, a deal finally getting done before the end of the year. Um, but first, you know, I'm happy to kind of give a rundown of the of the election results uh, and kind of, you know, certainly from the U.S. Chamber's perspective, what it means for us <clears throat> at the U.S. Chamber, what it means for the business community moving forward uh, into 2021 uh, and beyond. Um, uh, but first, I, you know, when we're talking about kind of the, the election results, uh, I always think it's important to note kind of our political strategy at the very beginning that we set out at the U.S. Chamber really immediately following the 2018 midterms was twofold. First, we wanted to, looking ahead to 2020, we wanted to defend the uh, pro-business majority in the Senate uh, and make sure that, uh, that we continue to have uh, solid pro-business senators there. And then uh, number two, to find uh, centrist Democrats, moderate Democrats that uh, have pro-business records, um, build relationships with those folks, build relationships with the incoming class in 2018, all of those freshmen, including seven, obviously, in the state of California, and really find folks that we could get behind, uh, that we could endorse in 2020. And that's why we endorsed uh, 30 uh, House Democrats running for re-election this cycle, including 22 freshmen. Um, that was the most uh, Democrats that we had endorsed in, I think, over a decade. Um, so that we thought that that was an important thing to do, particularly as, of course, Democrats had control of the House to try to build that pro-business contingent in the House and make sure uh, that those kind of moderates would have a greater amount of influence and that we would have a greater amount of, obviously, access and influence with those folks, um, but a greater amount of influence overall in the policy decision making and uh, with Speaker Pelosi. So those were kind of the two strategies, the two main points that we set out. And I think really on both fronts, we were successful in what we saw in the results of 2020, the, the election night. Um, you know, we had uh, about 20 uh, Senate candidates that we had endorsed that were victorious. We have two more outstanding in Georgia, of course, with the runoff on January 5th. Uh, we have endorsed uh, Senator Perdue as well as Senator Loeffler. And we have actually uh, released uh, uh, our latest ad earlier this week in support of both of those candidates. Um, but I think, you know, it was really kind of a surprising night to see kind of how things uh, played out in the Senate and in the House. Uh, most forecasters leading up to election night uh, predicted that Democrats had a, a pretty good shot of taking, taking control of the Senate. Um, you know, depending on who you're listening to or what you're reading, uh, most folks are putting it at a 75%, 80% or so shot that Democrats would take the Senate. Uh, most people on the House side thought that Democrats would expand their majority there by 10, 15, potentially even 20 seats. Um, and so really kind of based off of those baseline projections, the you know, election night was a really big surprise and a really good night for Republicans. Um, on the Senate side, I think going in, there was the expectation that uh, off the bat, Democrats would probably pick up at least one seat as a bare minimum, just looking at the polls from Colorado and Arizona, where Cory Gardner in Colorado had been down, you know, double digit points for the most part for most of the year. He was expected to lose. Uh, Senator McSally in Arizona was down between five and 10 points for most of the year. She was expected to lose. And then the, the sole Republican pickup uh, was going to be in Alabama, where the Democrat Doug Jones was obviously uh, had a, a really steep uphill climb in that very ruby red state. And so the, the, the baseline projection was that, uh, you know, you'd go from a 53-47 Republican majority in the Senate to 52-48 and that there would be three races in particular that would be pivotal in determining who would ultimately have control of the Senate. And those would be Maine, uh, where uh, Susan Collins was running for reelection. She had been down really also for most of the year, uh, down considerably and even written off at one point in the middle of the year. I mean, she was down seven, eight, nine points uh, on pretty much on a weekly basis. Um, and so that, that was a pivotal race. Uh, Iowa, Joni Ernst, where she was also showing uh, kind of some weakness. She was down by a couple of points for most of the year with her opponent, raising tremendous amounts of money. And then in North Carolina, Tom Tillis, where he had also been down for good parts of the year, although there was a scandal with Joe Cunningham or with uh, uh, um, uh, Cal Cunningham, uh, uh, kind of a, a, a texting scandal and, and affair scandal of sorts um, that I think derailed his chances there in, in North Carolina. That was the Democrat running against Tom Tillis. But those are really kind of the three pivotal races that people were looking at 
and the Republican incumbents won all three. And not only did they win all three, but by surprisingly large margins. When you look at the state of Maine, for example, Susan Collins winning by nine points, um, pretty remarkable given the fact that she was down eight or nine points for a good parts of the year. Uh, when you looked at the polling, Joni Ernst won by six points. Tom Tillis outperformed the president, winning North Carolina by two points. And, and, and that obviously, that, that's what determined uh, kind of the, the overall outcome and control of the Senate. Of course, we're going to see what happens with the two Georgia runoffs. But uh, I think as of right now, um, both Loeffler and Purdue would probably be the favorites to, to prevail. Uh, and Republicans only need to win one of those two runoff races in order to, to maintain control of the Senate in 2021. Some of the other races too are kind of interesting to look at. Uh, you look at kind of uh, Montana where Steve Daines, the Republican incumbent was running kind of neck and neck um, uh, for, for most of the end of the year with uh, Governor Bullock there. Uh, Daines ended up winning by 10 points. Um, there was a lot of talk about Texas turning purple. Cornyn could be in trouble. Lindsey Graham, of course, in South Carolina could be in trouble when you look at the, once again, outrageous amount of money that his opponent uh, uh, raised. And that was just kind of a general theme, just the overall amounts of money that were being raised uh, across the board in some of these Senate races was mind boggling. Um, but, you know, Lindsey Graham won by 10 points in South Carolina, uh, Senator Cornyn by 10 points in Texas. Um, so really good night for Republicans overall in the Senate. And I think a good night for the business community maintaining a pro-business majority in, their, in the Senate. Um, uh, and so that, that I think that that's been a good development overall on the House side, of course. Uh, another surprising kind of night for Republicans and the fact that they were able to pick up so many seats when they were expected to lose uh, quite a few seats. Uh, and now, you know, you're going to have a 222 to 213 Democrat advantage in the House. It's a, a nine seat advantage. It's one of the slimmest majorities that uh, that either party has, has had uh, over the last several decades. Um, and, I, you know, we had over 200 from the U.S. Chamber. We had over 200 folks that we had endorsed that won in the House. And uh, quite frankly, many of the, the House Democrats as well that we endorsed were, were victorious. Several of them lost, of course, given the fact that a lot of these folks were in very purple or moderate leaning districts. So naturally, a lot of the, the House Democrats that did lose on election night lost to, you know, to, to those Republican challengers. Um, but overall, I think we had a really good night across the board. Uh, you know, we, we've done a, a good job, I think, of establishing solid relationships with uh, those kind of centrist House Democrats. Um, particularly in the state of California, and even you look at uh, right there in Vista, Congressman Levin, who we've worked with quite a bit since he's come into office in 2018, uh, we've been able to find some really good common ground on issues that matter to the business community. So uh, we're happy to, to continue that momentum, and I think that we're going to be in a, in a position to really have a considerable amount of influence moving forward. Um, you know, it, what, it's kind of fascinating to see the results of this election and the fact that we're going to have divided government which is going to require bipartisanship. It's going to require Republicans and Democrats working across the aisle. Uh, and that's been kind of a center piece of our strategy, right, is to try to encourage and incentivize more bipartisanship by finding moderate Republicans, moderate Democrats that are willing to work together. And now that's what we're going to need in order to get things done. Um, this is the first time in a long time that an incoming president is not going to have unified control of government coming in. Uh, you think of, of course, Donald Trump coming in with the Republican Senate, Republican House, Obama coming in with the Democrat Senate, Democrat House. That has typically been the case. As a matter of fact, this is going to be the first time since 1884 that a, uh, a, a Democrat president will be coming into office without a Democrat Senate. Um, so, you know, usually those first, the first year or two uh, of an incoming administration, they kind of pursue more partisan goals and try to um, you know, uh, uh, put some wins on the board for their party. Uh, and that's kind of typically how it's been. And then the midterms, you see kind of a swing. And that's why uh, the president's party doesn't usually perform so well in the midterms. That's not necessarily going to be the case this time around, because right off the bat, uh, you know, the Biden administration is going to have to probably work with the Republican Senate. Uh, and you're going to have very slim majority in the House, right? So Republicans are going to have outsized influence in the House even. And I think a lot of those moderate Democrats are going to have a considerable amount of influence as well. So uh, bipartisanship is, is going to be absolutely necessary. And I think that that kind of bodes well for us in the business community. And that aligns with what we've been trying to do, quite frankly, for a number of years now, is to try to incentivize more of that bipartisanship. So hopefully we can get some wins on the board when we're talking about infrastructure, workforce development, which, is, which was already addressed on this call. That's going to need to be addressed as well at a national level, immigration reform. 
hopefully we can make some good progress there. So that's the long rundown of, of election night, what that might mean uh, moving forward. And I think why it puts us in good position uh, as the business community. As far as COVID is concerned, of course, there's been a lot of talk, a lot of development on that this week. Uh, on Tuesday, there was a group of four uh, Republican senators, four uh, Democrat senators, and, and the independent Angus King out of Maine. They came together with leaders of the uh, Problem Solvers Caucus out of the House. Um, they released a framework deal for what they want to see in the next COVID package. This is a, a $908 billion framework. The details have yet to be released. I, I think the plan is for them to, to have more of those details settled by this weekend, potentially by Monday. Um, but there are a lot of good things in this. We think at the U.S. Chamber that this is a really great starting point. Um, it's kind of the middle ground between what Republicans had asked for. If, if you all remember, Republicans had kind of, and McConnell has been clear on this, asking for somewhere around a $500 billion package. Uh, Democrats uh, have voted on a couple of proposals in the two and a half to $3 trillion range. So we think that this is a good middle ground. Um, it includes $288 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program, allowing businesses to get a second draw of PPP money. Um, it also allows for uh, business expense deductibility, which I'm sure a lot of your businesses have realized that if they took a PPP loan, they, they can't deduct their normal business expenses. That's a big problem, and that it, it will hopefully be addressed in this package. At least that's the goal. Um, uh, uh, there are a number of other things. There's $180 billion for unemployment insurance. That would be an extra kind of $300 per week supplemental for 18 weeks. $160 billion for state and local governments as well. Um, that's kind of been the major Democrat demand. And then the major Republican demand has been liability protections. And there's also kind of vague language that there's going to be temporary liability protections for businesses as well. So uh, a lot of good things going forward in this package. We think that this is a great starting point, something that can get Republican and Democrat support. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, we can continue to work on this and flesh out the details and get something voted on next week. Uh, either as a standalone package or something that has to hitch a ride on uh, the continuing resolution or omnibus, whatever comes out of the, the appropriations discussions. But um, that's where we're at with that. We're, we, you know, we've uh, come out in kind of general support of moving forward on this, and we're urging chambers as well uh, to do that, to weigh in. So I'd urge uh, folks that are on this call to weigh in with uh, Senator Feinstein and her office, Senator uh, Harris's office, as well as Congressman Levin's office. And I know that that Kyle from Congressman Levin's office is on uh, this call, but uh, I think that this is a good framework moving forward and hopefully we can get a deal done by the end of the year. So that's all I've got for now. Hopefully it wasn't too long, but happy to take any questions. Thanks Jennings. Gary, go ahead. You used the term pro-business. I can't imagine who or why any politician would be anti-business. Define those people who are anti-business? Sure. Well, we use a, a metric for this, really. I mean, that's kind of the, the, the baseline kind of um, uh, thing that we do. Uh, we have a legislative scorecard that we put out on an annual basis, um, and that's where we uh, are able to score legislators based on how they're voting on issues and votes that matter to the business community. Um, and so typically, if, if to earn our endorsement, a member of Congress would have to earn it over a 70% score with the United States Chamber on those issues. And we can, uh, you know, we're looking typically at about a dozen or so critical votes that come to the floor uh, on a given year. Um, so that 70% threshold is kind of what we're looking at. So when we're talking about members that aren't pro-business, uh, th those would typically be folks that fall in the, you know, 40% range, 50%, something like that. Um, that's, that's essentially kind of the grade school type metric that we use to determine what members we're endorsing and what members we're not going to be endorsing. So it's based on just votes. Votes so and person... we actually, we, we, for the most part votes and historically votes, although this last year we did include two new sections, uh, one devoted to bipartisanship and the other to legislative leadership. So we're also looking at, and when I'm talking about our overall strategy on incentivizing bipartisanship, we're also looking at members that are uh, you know, signing on, co-sponsoring pieces of legislation that were authored by a, a member of the opposite party, things like that to try to incentivize bipartisanship, understanding that that's, you know, a business priority. Um, so we're expanding it a little bit beyond just votes, but looking at kind of uh, those uh, behind the scenes behaviors as well. Couldn't somebody vote against whatever legislation 
came forward and have a different agenda that is pro-business? Sure. And yeah, we're not a single issue organization. So when we put together our scorecards, I mean, it usually involves votes that are across the board, that hit issues across the board, whether it's related to infrastructure and transportation or healthcare, or trade, um, you know, labor issues. I mean, you name it, we're looking at all of these issues, understanding that not everybody's going to be 100% aligned or, you know, 0% aligned with the U.S. Chamber. Most folks are going to be somewhere uh, kind of in the middle and not, you know, kind of be kind of all over the board on some of these issues. But uh, as a baseline, we use that 70% metric. Thank you. Thanks, Jennings. Okay. I think um, I don't see any other hands raised. So let's move along to our, um, our governmental updates. And we flip the agenda this time. So Kyle from Congressman Levin's office, you are up first. Thanks, Jennings. Yeah, no, thanks, Jennings. Uh, always great to hear uh, what the what the U.S. Chamber is up to and your perspective on things. Uh, <laughs> I get to hear what our team, you know, tells me in D.C. and you've got the pulse there too. It's it's great to hear from both sides. You know, um, Congressman Levin is in D.C. this week, um, voting on legislation. Uh, he actually spoke on the House floor uh, just this morning, um, calling for the coronavirus economic relief. Uh, he's very supportive of the bipartisan compromise bill that Jennings was talking about. Um, you know, he's been calling for support for small businesses and our local governments for months, um, you know, and so he's really glad to see this, hopefully making some progress. We're hearing from all of the leadership that this sounds like it might actually finally do something for the first time in a long time. Um, but I'll, I'll post the video um, of the congressman's comments on the House floor this morning. Um, I'll post a link in the chat here. But uh, looking back to some other things uh, the congressman's been up to uh, just last month, he introduced the Solar Jobs Preservation Act. Um, and that was with a Republican representative, Dave Schweikert from Arizona. So again, you know, we're talking about bills, uh, like Jennings was talking about, where if you bring a Republican and a Democrat together, um, that's been a, a priority of Congressman Levins. This is another example of those. Um, this bill specifically uh, strengthens the investment tax credit for solar, um, and that'll help pre preserve a lot of jobs and generate investment, um, especially here in the local solar industry. Vista, particularly when it comes to our district, um, is heavy with sol the solar industry. Um, and then uh, last month as well, um, on Veterans Day, Congressman Levin announced a panel um, that he's formed that's gonna work on providing recommendations uh, for folks who could be uh, good candidates to be naming of a local VA facility after, uh, specifically a woman veteran. Um, currently, there's only one facility in the entire United States that's named after a woman veteran. Um, and yet, you know, lots of uh, contributions from uh, women in our armed services um, throughout our history uh, that we can definitely name them after. And we have two facilities um, here in the district, uh, actually, that don't have names. Um, uh, the Oceanside VA Clinic um, and the VA Hospital down in La Jolla. So it's an opportunity to be able to recognize the contributions that women veterans have done for our country and also provide uh, some local uh, naming to these uh, VA facilities here in the district. Um, lots of other things going on, but I won't spend too much more time. I can answer any questions or provide more details if you have them. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks for being here. I didn't realize that there was only one facility that's named after a uh, woman. That's very interesting. Glad we have an opportunity to turn that around a little bit in San Diego. So thank you for that. Um, okay, let's see. Sorry, I accidentally minimized my agenda here. So let's hear next from uh, Salema from Tasha Berner Horvath's office. Are you with us today, Salema? I am, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, let me pull up my notes here. So there are a few updates coming uh, down from the state this week. Um, earlier this week, uh, the governor uh, actually announced a new set of actions uh, taken by the state to provide uh, temporary but direct relief to small businesses uh, as we continue to address the impact of the pandemic. Uh, so he directed the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration to provide an automatic three month extension for taxpayers uh, that are filing less than a million dollars in sales tax on their returns and to extend the availability of existing interest and penalty free payment agreements to companies that have up to $5 million in taxable sales. Um, and then in addition to that, um, the state also created the small business relief grant, which is um, a $500, a $500 million fund uh, for small businesses and eligible nonprofits that have been affected by uh, COVID-19 health and safety restrictions. 
Um, and so these are grants of up to $25,000 uh, per uh, small business or nonprofit, and they'll be available uh, by early next year. Um, so they're still working on getting that program launched. Um, and if you'd like to sign up for updates, um, you can do so at uh, business.ca.gov. Um, I can go ahead and put the link in the chat as well, um, just so that you're up to date on that if you're interested. Um, and so these are just temporary forms of assistance, um, you know, while the, while the uh, legislature returns in January uh, to continue working with the governor uh, to provide some further assistance to our small businesses. Um, you might know that the session begins January 4th. So right now the assembly member, um, she continues to meet with community leaders in a variety of fields um, just to prepare and to ensure that she has our district's priorities um, on top of mind. Um, and then I do have a few um, agency updates. Um, there's a few regarding the DMV. So um, you might know that um, seniors over the age of 70 whose licenses have an expiration date anytime between um, since March 1st and throughout the pandemic are now eligible to renew their licenses online, um, which is a good thing. It eliminates the requirement to uh, have an in-person visit uh, to the DMV in order to renew. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, they also extended uh, learner's permits with expiration dates through May 31st. Um, so most student drivers at this point should be covered uh, for the time being, allowing them more time to complete um, their requirements to obtain their license. Um, and then regarding the EDD, I know I say, I say this every time, um, but we're still assisting people um, you know, with uh, the troubles and issues that they've been experiencing. Um, so, you know, please continue to refer your friends, your family, coworkers, um, if they live within our district, um, or, you know, their system has, their new system um, for referring cases has definitely proved to be much more beneficial, both in terms of getting quick responses um, and clear answers from EDD staff. Um, and so one thing I did want to note on that um, is we have been getting um, increasing number of questions regarding um, the pandemic unemployment assistance program, um, which we know is entirely funded by um, the federal government. So we're definitely monitoring that. It's set to end at the end of the year. Um, so anybody who's um, under this uh, PUA program, whether it's a self-employed worker, um, independent contractor or anyone otherwise ineligible for regular state unemployment benefits um, are definitely, you know, questioning whether they'll still be receiving their benefits uh, come January. So again, we're definitely monitoring that just to, um, you know, ensure that we um, are able to answer these questions and hopefully, um, you know, we can get some um, action on on Congress's side in order to continue issuing these benefits. Um, and so that's pretty much it for me today. Um, I just wanted to lastly plug in that the assembly member is hosting another one of her teleton halls this afternoon. Um, this week it's focused on how to apply for college. So she'll have panelists from CSU San Marcos and Cash for College um, to discuss any changes in the application process due to the pandemic and then any advice as to what resources are available to students um, to pay for college. And so again, that's this afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, if you're interested, I'm happy to provide the dial-in information um, in the chat box below. But um, yeah, that's really it for me today. Thank you so much. Any questions for Salima? Go ahead, Gary. Uh, one suggestion with the DMV. Mm -hmm. it seems like we're just filtering out little bits of change here and there. I think it would be a great thing if, if it, the assembly person would just do a complete update on the DMV. You mentioned over 70 can renew online. You, you know, there's so, can you go in and actually get the new ID? You know, those kinds of things. I, I would think that there, got, there should be a Q and A that would probably be 10 questions that could really help everybody because there are a lot of people out there with expired driver's license. They've tried or they just don't know what to do. They've tried to get an appointment. So if, if there is a DMV position paper on all these different issues, Q&A, that would be my suggestion. 
Yeah, definitely. And I'm happy to pass that along. Um, I know the DMV does release um, press releases, um, you know, on a frequent basis, just uh, reiterating the um, the updates that they're uh, and the changes that they've been making. Um, but I do see, you know, where you're coming from, just a consolidated Q&A list um, of, you know, frequently asked questions. I know that's something that the EDD does. Um, so I definitely, um, I'll definitely re relay that along and see, um, you know, if there's a consolidated list or maybe even something that our office can provide to you you um if it would be beneficial I'm, i don't seem to be on that list that gets all those updates and i think most people aren't on the list so that q a could uh, or faq could really really be helpful to people well, yeah. we can take a look too gary um you know we put out a weekly newsletter with just resources and information so i'll make an i made a note here to have my team take a look at the dmva DMV website to see if there's anything um, already put together that um, and to reach out to their team to see if there's anything that we can include in our regular updates as well. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Matthew from Senator Pat Beat's office. Hi, Matthew. How Hi. are you? Good. How are you, Rachel? Good. Thank you. Um, yes, and Lima did, did a great job of covering some uh, points on the just this assembly or senate side uh, that I was going to cover. Um, but yes, uh, the new session will be typically starting uh, next week um, in December. Um, obviously, things are going to be looking a lot different uh, this coming session um, and just how, how things are done, um, kind of the process, um, swearing in of new members, et cetera. Um, so we're still kind of getting all of that information and how those things are going to be handled um, in the new environment that we're in. Uh, so we'll have more updates on it for you then. Um, in the meantime, obviously, this is kind of a time when we reach out um, and want input um, when it comes to legislation that's going to be uh, presented in the coming year. Um, so if you do have any um, legislative ideas or organizations or groups um, that are looking for um, some legislative fixes, ideas, uh, we'd, be, uh, we'd love to hear all of those. <clears throat> so please connect with me um, or our office uh, so that we can take a look at that um, and start seeing where we can uh, take that uh, in this coming year. Um, this morning, I'll send a link or I'll put a link in the chat, but this morning, uh, the Senator and uh, Senator Nielsen uh, teamed up and wrote an op-ed for the Sacramento Bee, um, and it is all about um, the contract, $35 million contract that the Secretary of State's office had with a partisan uh, Washington DC based political firm. Um, so some interesting, an interesting read there of uh, that, that process, um, a lot of the issues that are with that are in, in within that contract. Um, and so I will uh, provide that for everybody to read, um, but just an, an issue that might not have gotten enough <clears throat> media attention that's still important that we should all be paying attention to. Um, Obviously, like Salima said, um, yeah, we're still handling a lot of EDD cases as well, um, but we're also still working on um, all of our normal um, California State Agency cases. Uh, so whether it's, it's the FTB, DMV, um, whatever agency it may be, uh, we're here to help um, and we're still here uh, to take your phone calls, emails, uh, whatever it may be, um, and help you with those issues. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out and uh, we'd be happy to help. Any questions? Gary? I would just echo to you what I said to Selena. You know, it, this can't be everything goes up. You know, assembly and Senate should be coming down to the voters. What can we do to inform you or to support you? And one of those things obviously is DMV. So I would suggest that Senator Bates could be involved in some sort of a FAQ as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just on the uh, DMV issue, I mean, it's been unbelievable the amount of updates we've gotten from their office. I um, mean, we get them at the same time that all of you do um, of just the changes and different ways and processes that they've decided to do things. Um, unfortunately, that's not something we have much control over, um, but I'm sure um, in, here in the coming new session, uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of committee meetings um, and discussions about those things and, and processes uh, like you're mentioning and how that how that works in the future going forward because it's it's certainly been a mess and uh, it's it's been all over the place at least in terms of DMV with what what they're allowing what they're not allowing um, and how that changes from day to day or sometimes week to week uh, so I'll definitely relay that as well Gary uh, those concerns because uh, they're they're very important and uh, it's certainly something that a lot of folks have reached out about so thank you so much Matthew thank you Always nice to hear from you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next up is Crystal Jabara from Supervisor Desmond's office. Thanks for being here, Crystal. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. A lot going on. I am watching the governor's press conference right now, um, and it looks like um, they are taking a regional approach to shutdowns in um, San Diego. While we are doing moderately well, the rest of the region is not. So the Southern California region is posed to go into mandatory shutdowns early December, is what he said. And since we are in early December, that could be tomorrow, that could be next week. And what they are saying is when ICU capacity drops below 15%, that will be the trigger to move into um, the closure of um, nail salons, personal care services, um, bars, uh, restaurants for outdoor dining. They would only be able to do takeout schools would be able to remain open um, that are already open. So those that have the waivers um, and retail would be bumped down to 20% capacity. To put it into perspective, San Diego County's running our, um, I, and I see Aaron's on this call so he could talk a little bit about Tri-City specifically, um, but ICU capacity in San Diego County seems to be running in the low 20%. So we have quite a bit of availability. Although when you get into the numbers, um, about 53 more patients in San Diego County would put us into um, uh, probably that seven or the 15% availability. Um, so they're watching those numbers, but our neighbors like Imperial County and LA County um, are a much higher usage for ICU capacity. So I'm sure more specific information will be coming out. I'll get a briefing later today from a county level, but just so everyone's aware of that. On uh, another note, the, the Board of Supervisors does have another round of grant funding that is available. Supervisor Desmond will have $4 million um, that they can start approving to give away. The eligible cat categories for this one are gonna be restaurants, gyms, fitness centers, you know, a, a yoga studio, um, movie theaters, museums, zoos, aquariums, special events in any associated industry. So photographer, florist, um, et cetera, um, street fairs, farmers markets, they are all eligible for grant funding. If they have not applied and received funds in the past, they do have to put in a new application. I'm gonna put the, um, the website in the chat, I'm gonna put it in there right now. If they have applied, if the business has applied before and received funding, all they have to do is email our grants administrator who is Candace Yee, a lot of people know her, anyone who has received funding knows her. Um, her email is also in the chat. Um, or you can reach out to me directly and I'll help you with that. And we also share all the information with the chamber. So Rachel can also point you in the right direction, either to me or um, to the application. They're great at getting um, the word out when these funds are available. It's gonna move very quickly. I have a feeling um, we'll be late docketing items um, tonight or tomorrow morning to be approved for the Board of Supervisors meeting on Tuesday. And then we'll have another round after that and the funds will be distributed pretty quickly and have to be spent very quickly as well, but you can reimburse for expenses that you've already had. So more money coming for our businesses that are needing it. Um, hopefully we'll have more in the future if we're gonna cause more shutdowns. Um, and then as we get new information, um, I make sure that each of the chambers know. So your chamber is a good source for solid information coming out of the county. And we appreciate you guys helping us get the word out. It's really, um, we get a lot of calls, a lot of emails every day. And I know the chamber, the stuff that's coming from the chamber is credible. So you can count on that information. So if there are any questions, um, type them into the chat or go ahead and call me or email me. Thank you, Crystal. Thanks for that update. Um, it sounds like um, you know, there'd been some early rumors earlier this week on kind of what this announcement today was going to look like, and it sounds like it's right on track, um, that regional approach and the ICU capacity being the key, key yeah. pieces. Um, and um, I did not, what the piece I had not heard was about the schools. So that's interesting to know, you know, Vista Unified is operating, has a classic module where kids are in school in person. So that definitely impacts our community, whether the schools are open or not. So um, thank you for that piece as well. 
um, and um, we'll be, we have a, a COVID newsletter or a newsletter that goes out every Thursday. So I was just texting Kathy in my office saying, don't send the newsletter. We have so much more stuff to add to it. So please don't send it yet. So um, thank you for that. And um, it looks like, Gary, did you have a question? I did. You're, you're talking about ICU capacity. What are, what are hospitals doing to expand that? We're gonna hear from Eric in just a moment. I'm sorry, Aaron. I'm sorry from Aaron in just a moment. I said Eric, but I meant Aaron. And also on on a um, on a regional yeah. level, there um, the governor announced, and I didn't look at the complete list, um, new hospital capacities for heavily impacted areas like Imperial County. They have hospital beds coming online, um, but we are what's called um, we have a warm hospital availability. So the floor at Palomar Hospital. Um, is available to start up and start operating anytime that they feel they need it for ICU and hospital capacities. And then I know the individual hospitals, and I'll let Aaron speak to this, um, work together to make sure that all their patients' needs are being met. So I'll let Aaron address that. But they do up and down the state of California are bringing online more hospital capacity and then have what's called the warm tier, so um, space that is available to go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna jump over to Amanda Lee with the City of Vista, which is next on our agenda. Amanda, how are you today? I'm doing swell. How is everyone else doing? Hmm. It's a little bit sad trombone over here, frankly, but oh. doing okay. Just with these announcements, worrying about yeah. our, our businesses here. We will, we will, we will persevere. Yes. Um, I do, I know that we all want to kind of find out what's going on, so I will be really short and brief. Um, do want to let you know that we're going to, VISTA's um, working on our economic development st um, strategy, and we're developing a roadmap, and we would love the um, insight of our business community and also our residents. So we do have holding two, oh, I got a, there's a brush fire. Sorry, I'm alert. <laughs> I, we should all be getting one soon on our phone. Sorry, scared me. Yeah. You know um, what, Amanda, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. There's a uh, brush fire in San Marcos, a vegetation fire. Yes. Is that the one, the alert? It seems to be um, getting under control. So if you see yeah. it, it's blowing into Vista, but don't panic. Yeah, it's on Twin Oaks Valley Road, Deer Springs, Borden. So yeah. um, perfect. Sorry, it just, the alert frightened me. I apologize. Um, but basically, we are having two um, economic development meetings, and we'd love for the business community and also our residents to share their insight. Um, one will be on December 10th, and that will be at 8 a.m., and then also on January 6th um, at 4 p.m. Both of those are for the business community, and then our residents can also participate um, on both those dates, but at 6.30. Um, I will go ahead and share the information in the chat. You do have to RSVP to get the Zoom link because it is um, via Zoom. So I went ahead and sent that off. Um, I gave the information for the business, but um, again, residence is at 6.30. So I know that maybe someone wants to attend at that time as well. Um, and then um, we have a really large agenda. We have over 28 items on our agenda. That's pretty large for the city. Um, so if you would like to um, go on and have any feedback about any of our items, um, our meetings are still being held via Zoom at 5.30 and that will be next Tuesday on December December 8th. And that is it. Thank you very much, Amanda. So um, we're going to hear um, from Katie with SDG&E, and then we'll go to Erin. Um, and then I have just a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll wrap up. And thanks, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard about the widespread public safety power shutoff event that has um, launched and is impacting a variety of different areas throughout the county. Um, we have a severe weather event that started yesterday and with a series of significant increasing winds um, all throughout our service territory. Usually when we have red flag warnings, they uh, impact kind of isolated areas of our eastern parts of our county. And this event is very unique where it's kind of blanketing all over diff uh, various different parts of SDG&E service territory. 
Um, so to give you an idea of kind of some of the wins and record-breaking ones, I should say that we're seeing, I'm gonna share a few stats to kind of um, illustrate the event that we're kind of up against and will continue to be uh, facing going into the week weekend. Um, we have 220 weather stations. I think I talked about this at the last meeting at a high level that really give us um, a good idea of what's happening in different microclimates all throughout our service territory. And they've all been collecting data for quite some time. So 31 of those 220 weather stations have met or exceeded their all-time Santa Ana wind gust records that we have recorded. 24 weather stations have reported gusts in excess of 60 miles per hour, seven of which have reported gusts above 70 miles per hour. Um, and just to put that into context, a category one hurricane is starting at 75 miles per hour and above. Um, and the top gust of our weather network thus far has been 94 miles an hour at Sill Hill, which is an area out in Discanso. So, um, and that was the, since it was recorded, started recording back in 2012. So that just gives you an idea of some of the significant wind events that we're seeing all over our service territory. Vista has not been impacted and they're not expected to be an area that we might need to possibly um, shut off power for safety reasons, but there are surrounding communities that have either been impacted or are still at risk either between now and the end of the weekend. Um, and let's see, what else do, there are, if for some reason something changes, there are a variety of different community resource centers that have been set up for drive-through resources to either charge phones for, um, if you have family members that maybe live in some of the other areas that are impacted by these uh, power outages. We have about 69,000 customers that are still without power now um, with about 26,000 that are still kind of in the at-risk area. So if wind conditions materialize, they could be at risk for a public safety power shutoff event as well. Um, the best way to keep up-to-date information, or if you want to see, <clears throat> there are some tools online where you can type in specific uh, addresses to see if that area has been impacted or not. I will put everything in the chat. Um, and there is also a live outage map that will tell you um, all the different areas that are impacted by the public safety power shutoff events. Um, there are two, I think right now, unplanned outages that are not related to weather events um, that crews are working on restoring. Uh, and it will also, the outage map gives estimated restoration times that we um, think we can have the power safely restored. Uh, the last thing I wanna highlight too is um, once the, our meteorology team has uh, said the weather event has subsided, there are a series of safety protocols that need to take place before we can safely re-energize the lines. So um, we have to have uh, the lines inspected to make sure uh, debris or uh, tree branches, things of that nature have not fallen into the lines. Uh, the last thing we want is to flip the switch and, and have something like that cause an ignition. So we have to make sure that it's either crews that inspect every single line or we can sometimes use aerial assets to um, speed up that process as well. So um, please let me know if you have any questions. I'll post the links on how you can get real-time information on everything that has been happening. And um, so that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. You're muted there, Rachel. Can't hear you, Rachel. Oh, I'm sorry. I accidentally hit the button on the keyboard that does the keyboard mute and not the mute mute. So sorry about that. Um, I was just saying thank you, Katie, for that information. Um, and then any of the information that anyone has put in the chat, we will grab and include in our e-news that's going out later this afternoon. So I know I've received a few texts and calls today about uh, power safety shutoffs. So I really thank you for this timely information. So with that, um, I'd like to move next to Erin um, with Tri City Medical Center. If you have anything you'd like to share or give an update. Sure. Um, so obviously there's this pandemic going on. <laughs> so there's quite a few COVID patients, uh, you know, uh, in the community and in the hospital. You know, we've had since the early stages of the pandemic, a multi-tiered surge plan. That is, depending on certain scenarios, you would be able to surge up bed capacity uh, and things of that nature. Early on, our primary concern was around personal protective equipment because there was a major run on that early on. Now, personal protective equipment is less of a concern that we are producing quite a bit as a country, as a world. Um, right now, I would say that when they talk about capacity, the capacity issue is less about beds and it's more about staffing. Who do you actually have staffed the beds? Um, and so 
you know, beds are relatively easy to procure. Um, nurses are, <laughs> are less easy to procure. Uh, and so, you know, all across the country, people, hospitals are trying to get particularly critical care trained nurses into their hospitals. Um, some of it's through hiring at the hospital. Some of it's through bringing in what they call traveler nurses and things of that nature. Um, but everyone's competing for a fixed pool uh, of, uh, of staff members for things like that. So I would say that that is the biggest capacity concern. You know, as we look at places like Palomar, obviously they have that federal medical station uh, upstairs. Um, the challenge with with those things is that they're essentially cots. They're not really ICU beds. And so you have to be able to change other beds within the hospital and the ICU beds if people are less sick so they can move up to the cot federal medical station kind of thing. And that's what all the hospitals are dealing with is that, you know, you might be able to open up additional areas within a hospital, uh, but how do you staff them uh, with the appropriate level of care for the, the, um, the level of need for the patient. So, you know, as we've gone on in the pandemic, we had uh, the first surge, the real surge that hit was in July. And so you see this trend line go along and it goes up and it comes back down. It was kind of heading down. And then right after Halloween, I'm sure that's just a coincidence, it went whoop and went straight up. Uh, and so we currently right now have uh, 37 patients in the hospital with COVID. Um, a small percentage of those patients are ICU level patients. So intensive care unit level patients are ICU capacity. So we're, we're at 50% capacity right now, as far as beds. Um, and so, um, and of that 50%, only 40% of that are COVID patients. Uh, so it's a relatively small number in the ICU, but we have a larger number within the hospital on other monitored units like telemetry and things like that, which require a higher level of training and whatnot for nursing staff and physicians and things of that nature. And so we're on constant, never-ending phone calls with uh, the California Department of Public Health and the California Hospital Association and all these different groups trying to address concerns with, you know, there's, there's mandates that are coming down to for instance, uh, test all, all healthcare employees once a week. Some people say it's twice a week. That's a very difficult logistical undertaking to, to do that. Um, not to mention, there's always still concerns about the availability of testing supplies and the costs associated with it and things like that. Uh, there's also, you know, California is one of the few places that has nurse staffing ratios. So nurses can't have more than a couple a certain number of, of patients depending on the level of acuity in the hospital. Uh, and so, um, you know, as you look towards surges, you start to think, okay, well, is there any potential relaxation of those nurse staffing ratios and things of that? Um, and so far, there hasn't been any indication that that's really an option, uh, but we'll see. Um, so those are some of the things that the hospitals are dealing with. You know, Tri-City has actually... Uh, done pretty well by reducing costs over the course of this time. We lost about $37 million uh, because of the pandemic uh, so far this year. We made up for it a little bit. Thank you to Congressman Levin and the folks at the federal level for providing some funding uh, to the hostels. We got about $7 million for the CARES Act, so that helped offset some of it um, and, and whatnot. But yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting, it's, it's been an interesting road. Uh, I was actually, just before I came to this meeting, I was uh, I was in meetings with the CEO with the California Hospital Association discussing these issues. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, you know, we are fairly well positioned based on our current uh, census to to deal with these uh, these issues. But you know, if you're looking at the, the it's kind of a conversion rate of new um, positive COVID tests and what percentage of those will end up in the hospital, and as you look at those numbers. Mm, it could be pretty interesting uh, in the near future, particularly with, we're going to find out real, real soon if, uh, if Thanksgiving had the same effect that Halloween did. And then potentially after that, uh, things like uh, Christmas, but you mix into that now there's vaccines that are potentially going to be hitting the, the ground here pretty soon. And how many vaccines do you get? Who's getting them? That's all being discussed right now. So frontline healthcare workers, thankfully, are going to be top of the list. So that would not be people like me. That would be like nurses and doctors who are actually treating patients on a, on a daily basis. And then they kind of go from there. So there's a lot of moving parts in this, in this equation.
Thank you, Aaron. Really appreciate that uh, update. I know I didn't have you on the agenda. I just said, hey, can you give an update? So thank you for that. Yeah, no um, problem. Any questions for Aaron or for Katie? I didn't really ask for questions. It's shocking. Gary, you have a question? I do. Surprising, <laughs> right, Aaron? Yeah. Yes, it is. Is your nursing shortage because of nurses who have chosen not to work because of the COVID? Or is it just an overall nursing shortage regardless of whether there's a COVID? Because I would think there'd be enough nurses to handle 70 to 90% capacity without the COVID. Well, so it's more of just because there's increased demand overall. And, you know, don't forget, so if 40% of our, of our patients in the ICU are COVID, that means 60% are not. They have heart attacks, strokes, all these other things that are going on simultaneously. And so, you know, um, I will say that critical, critical care nurses have a certain level of training and experience to deal with the sickest of the sick. And um, maybe what you would call like a floor nurse, like somebody who's like in a typical medical surge, medical surgical unit um, is obviously highly trained as a nurse, but may not be in the same uh, kind of category for dealing with those patients that maybe you're on uh, a rotoprone bed that turns you over, you know, when you have COVID or have multiple drip systems and pumps and all these different things that are kind of going on. So it gets kind of complicated. And then to complicate matters even further, um, there are union contracts. And the union contracts will kind of determine, you know, which nurses will work in which units under which circumstances and things like that. So, as I said, it's a complicated puzzle. Um, but I mean, overall, it's just that there's not a lot of nurses out there. And there are uh, places that are financially able to spend a very large sum of money to recruit nurses to come to them. Uh, and everybody's competing for the same pool of nurses. That's a good point. You know, it reminds me a little bit about um, some of the conversations happening at the school district with substitute teachers and how if a teacher has to quarantine for 14 days, like if a nurse is exposed and has to quarantine, then you need people to fill in in that space. And that's the same thing that's happening with teachers. Like some of the high schools have to go ahead and close the high school because they don't have enough subs to fill in if somebody's exposed. And so it's, 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 it's an issue of just so many pieces. And so I uh, thank you for helping to explain that. I appreciate yeah, it. And, and I think the other thing is that it's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week business. Yep. You know, there's three shifts per day at the hospital. You know, sometimes I, you know, we get, we get some, uh, some people give us comments about the age of the facility. And I'm like, well, yeah, the facilities in some places, 60 years old. I mean, literally next year will be 60 years old, but it's not a facility that was operating nine to five for 60 years. It's a facility that's operating every minute of every day and has never closed down for 60 years. So it gets a lot of, uh, it gets a lot of wear and tear. So the same thing can be said for staffing. You, you have 24 hours a day, seven days a week staffing and the place never closes. Um, and so it, it adds a little bit of extra difficulty in recruiting the number that you may need. Right now we're okay. We figured out a way to, to handle these things. But if you're looking and projecting out, mm -hmm. you know, if the numbers continue to rise, there could be challenges for all hospitals. And this is literally something that every single hospital is dealing with right now. Thank you so much, Aaron. Yep. Um, okay, so just a couple of uh, quick announcements from the chamber. I just wanted to uh, let you all know if you had not heard that Unfortunately, we were forced to cancel our Christmas parade that was to be held this Saturday. Um, unfortunately, we had, well, we had a lot of people interested in coming to the parade. We unfortunately didn't have very many folks who were able to participate and be in the parade. So you can't have a parade without parade participants. So unfortunately, um, we did need to cancel that. But we're excited at the chamber to support the city's uh, Jingle Terrace Park endeavor, which is a holiday drive through light experience happening at, at uh, Jingle Terrace Park uh, as it's going to be known for the next month instead of Bringle Terrace Park, but um, we're excited to participate in that and so hope that you'll check it out. We're hosting um, a holiday mixer next Wednesday from 4.30 to 6. It's a super fun. It's sponsored by Edco and the first 30 folks who sign up, there is an event page on our Facebook page. You can sign up and register for a ticket. The first 30 folks who sign up, we're going to get an amazing treat box delivered to enjoy during the mixer with some libations and treats and snacks and a fun game to play. So 
Um, if you're not one of the first 30, you'll still get to play the game. We'll have ugly sweater contest, festive mask contest. So we're excited about that. Hopefully you can join us. Um, and then the last thing I wanna share is some somber news. If you had not heard, um, the chamber uh, experienced a personal loss um, with the loss of our past chair, Nick Lubick, who passed away on November 19th. Um, so we still don't really know what happened. Um, but he was very young and uh, an important and integral part of our chamber organization. And the loss of Nick is gonna be felt for a really long time. Uh, his family is a very philanthropic, philanthropic family in town and um, very, just he was loved by so many people. So just wanna share that um, we are working on a Zoom celebration of life just to honor him. And when we have that information, we'll share that out with everybody. If you knew Nick, or even if you didn't, um, if you're part of the chamber, uh, the Vista Chamber, he touched your life in some way. And so we wanna honor his uh, legacy of kindness and um, we'll have more information about that in the future. Um, so with that, I want to wish everyone a very uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Um, I can't believe that we're finally closing the door on this year. And uh, I wish you all the best in 2021 and look forward to seeing you here again in January, if I don't see you before. So thank you very much for, for being here today and have a wonderful day.